Welcome to the Eco Business Podcast. I'm Ping Manongdo, Philippines Country Manager at Eco Business, Asia Pacific's leading sustainability publication. In today's show, we're going to attempt to answer the question, what happens to waste, and dig into the recycling systems in the Philippines. The proliferation of plastic waste and how it has polluted oceans and waterways has been a global concern even before the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, however, the use of plastic has undeniably soared as the material is relied upon to protect people and goods from exposure to the virus. While it may take some time to precisely account just how much additional plastic waste was generated during this time, initial data raises red flags. A bigger pandemic and a more serious plastic pandemic is in the making should the world continue with its current ways of using and disposing of plastics improperly under the COVID reality. The Philippines ranks as the world's third largest polluter with 2.7 million metric tons of plastic waste generated each year. Although the country's garbage collection rate fares better among Southeast Asian countries, rubbish is not properly disposed of. According to a 2018 report by Worldwide Fund for Nature, up to 74% of plastic in the Philippines that ends up in the ocean is from waste that has already been collected. The low recycling rate of low value plastic material also contributes to the marine litter problem. We know that recycling cannot rely on one sector alone. Therefore, it's important to make everyone understand what exactly happens to waste when you drop it inside trash cans. What is the real story behind how recycling is done in the country? And how has this changed in the face of a pandemic? Joining us in today's podcast is Mr. Bonner Loreto, Executive Director, Business for Sustainable Development, and the Country Manager for Corporate and Government Affairs for Mondelez, Philippines, Mr. Toff Rada. Hi, Bon. Let's jump in into um, our questions for the day. Bon, what is the real story and status behind recycling in the Philippines, and how has this pandemic changed this? Hi, Ping. Uh, thank you for having me here. Hi, Toph. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, jumping right into the question, um, Philipp the Philippines recycling industry is not really what we hope we'd like to have uh, to ensure that we don't litter, uh, leak our plastics into the environment. Uh, in terms of collection, we have a really high rate of collection. However, the challenge is at the disposal stage. Um, while there's budget for uh, governments, local governments to collect waste, there's very little budget to turn these waste into something of value. And that's where private sector must come in. But also there's challenges in the way private sector uh, can position itself uh, in, in terms of investing in recycling because um, the, the market for recycled products simply is not there. And therefore, uh, most of the recycling in the country uh, is really just the primary recycling and most of the uh, products of recycling are actually exported to other countries. The challenge also is the type of materials that we use in the country. Um, mm -hmm. Recycling is, is a, a specific only uh, to specific types of plastics. Um, so there are plastics that are highly recyclable, but there are also plastics that we don't have yet the infrastructure, uh, uh, at least in the country, to process, um, to, to make something out of it uh, that is also valuable to the market. So uh, these combination of factors led to us having a very um, low rate of recycling and a very low mm -hmm. rate of investments in recycling infrastructure, even if collection is very high. And that situation, regardless of high collection, will really lead to leakage to the environment because also the disposal facilities are not sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. Landfills, sanitary landfills, that is true to its definition, um, it's very rare in the Philippines. In the country, in the countryside, there are no true to definition landfills. And therefore, what's happening in the countryside is really mostly dumping them um, mm -hmm. in vacant lots, sometimes burning them, 
Uh, and when there's rain and there's flood, easily those areas where there's dump sites near bodies of water, easily the plastics could leak into the bodies of water and eventually to the ocean. And that's how plastics leak. So there's a lot of help that the recycling industry uh, will need, um, not just in terms of market, but most importantly, in terms of enabling policies. You've spotlighted uh, very, very articulately the issues, Bon. Thank you so much for that overview. And I'd like to mention thank you to Mondelez uh, Philippines for sponsoring this conversation because um, it really has to continue for us to arrive at a solution. So you mentioned uh, very articulately, Bonner, that uh, this problem has been going on and it is a something that all sectors of society has to look into. Now, can you explain to us what happens to plastic and other waste after people throw them in the garbage can? Because this is an area which not a lot of people are very familiar with, although they do it a lot. And how can actually every one of us um, play our role so that plastic can be recycled? And how does it become recycled? Okay, so there are different scenarios. What happens to um, plastics or any waste material thrown in a trash bin. So in areas where there is collection, the urban areas, normally these plastics are being collected by someone we call palero. And these are the workers, waste collectors who go with the dump trucks. And um, depending on the policy implementation of the local government, it could either be dumped with all the other waste in the dump truck or if the local government is quite advanced, then it's actually um, dumped as a uh, 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 mixed with other non-bio or versus bio waste. Mm -hmm. So what happens then is the, the truck goes around, collects all the waste, and then it goes to a disposal facility. Now that disposal facility uh, could either be a true to definition landfill, in which case, when the wastes are um, dumped in, uh, or deposited there, uh, they're first treated and they're, uh, and they're stored in a manner that is covered, uh, that is uh, ensured that there's lining underneath so they don't leach into the soil. And mm -hmm. they're kept there and ensured that even if there's flooding, it doesn't leak to the environment. Now, if... Uh, and, and this is for most cases, most local government. Uh, I've seen, uh, I've visited more than 10 locations and more than 10 dump sites in the country from mm -hmm. Northern Luzon to the General Santos City. You would see in, in Davao, you would see um, waste disposal uh, areas where the, the waste are just actually dumped in an open field. Mm -hmm. And that is really a scenario. And, and this is happening in, you know, in, in many, many, I think maybe 60% of uh, wild guests, 60% of local governments still do not have the sanitary landfills. And you can validate the data with the Solid Waste Commission. Um, but what I'm saying is majority of the local governments still rely on dumping in areas where uh, there's no proper uh, uh, landfill standards. And when mm -hmm. that happens, you would expect that when there is rain and there's flooding, and as I said, it will leak, uh, the, the plastics will easily float, and then that's how leakage will actually happen. Um, now, if you go back to the trash bin again, um, if the trash bin uh, in your home, for example, is mixed with bio waste. Uh, if you're mixing bio waste, that normally is, um, a, you know, um, sticky. Normally, is, uh, could contaminate. It's wet, yeah. Mm -hmm. the other recyclables. Well, mm -hmm. Then what it does is it can actually contaminate the recyclables. So, for example, mm -hmm. even if you have uh, shampoo bottles, which are made up of HDPE uh, type of plastic. And they go to the junk shop. And then the, after that, then they go to a consolidator and goes to a recycling facility. Uh, mm -hmm. The value of that packaging, if it's con more contaminated, will be, more, it will, will be lower because it will take another step, which is to actually wash them. And the washing process yeah. is very expensive. Um, mm -hmm. and, and therefore, 
Um, and, and there are very strict rules. We have very strict rules for good, good reason in terms of effluent standards. Um, and therefore, the, the very expensive nature of recycling also reduces the recycling base. Um, mm-hmm. And therefore, in some areas, um, it is no longer worth collecting because then the price of uh, having to collect transport and, re- and wash until it becomes ready as feedstock for recycling will be prohibitive. And therefore, they don't get collected, even if they're recycled. So that's what happens to the trash that we, you put actually in the, in the bins. So Bonner, uh, that really is a very clear um, outline of the scenario. So what we're trying to say is that people have to understand that it does have to begin in the households, correct? So, so what should you tell the, uh, the people, uh, families in the households? How must they um, segregate and perhaps dry the, the recyclable uh, materials before putting them in the, in the, in the bins? And from there, uh, because what happens is that, for example, in my household, I do segregate, but I notice that when it gets into the hands of the palero, as you, as you mentioned, uh, they still put it all together in the dump truck, you know, um, after being segregated from my household, they still put it all together. So how do you connect the dot and what is needed for these dots to be connected in the first place? Okay, that's a very smart question, Pin. Um, I think very much uh, you have grasped the problem of uh, solid waste because unless mm-hmm. we connect the dots, unless we have an entire end-to-end process, Whatever you do in segregation doesn't really matter. So first, Mm -hmm. in a community, um, one must work towards setting up the entire system. If it's only one or two components out of the five components, it doesn't work. You have to have all the Mm -hmm. five or six components in place. Uh, Because people get tired of segregation, as you said. If If they see that the trucks will actually just mix it. So if you're living mm-hmm. in a located subdivision, for example, you have an influence in your homeowners association to actually talk to your homeowners and structure the policy and practice of waste collection. So for example, mm-hmm. a very simple and very doable way of setting up the waste collection is just to have separate days for collection of the bio-waste and separate days for collection of the non-bio-waste. Now, this is quite viable because, number one, the homeowners are paying for the cost of collection. Now, if there's a way to make the collection more efficient, number one, and number two, if there's a way to reduce the amount of waste that's collected, then it impacts uh, the cost of that, that homeowners are paying. Now, mm-hmm. um, the other strategy would be... Um, if the homeowners can influence the home, the sorry, the association can influence the homeowners, or at least come up with a policy that um, they will only collect the non-bio, mm-hmm. and then encourage everyone to do composting. If they don't mm-hmm. have the space, they can use um, pails uh, for composting. It's covered. You can. There's a lot of technology from Bokashi to African yes. flies, um, maggots uh, that will um, mm-hmm. just digest everything uh, that you throw in in terms of bio. And then just now throws out uh, in your trash bins the dry yeah. uh, waste. So if that happens, then you're actually starting the first step of a, a segregated um, storage at the household mm-hmm. and segregated collection. And now that will now, um, you know, have greater chances of recovering what can be recycled. And Mm -hmm. the collectors of waste can now actually recover what can be recycled. And then they can go to the junk shop first and then dump what is recycled there. And then the rest Mm -hmm. that cannot be sold can, uh, which hopefully will just be um, a fraction of the total waste can now go to landfills. Now, there's another important step that if households can do will increase the chance of recyclability, increase the recycling rate and the chance that these plastics will be recycled. 
So mm-hmm. you notice that when you use uh, tomato paste, tomato sauce, things that are sticky, they tend to yeah. stick in the packaging. Correct. Now, if you can take a, just a little effort after using that by rinsing mm-hmm. what is inside, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's a flexible packaging or whether it's a shampoo bottle uh, that would potentially have contamination inside, if you can just mm-hmm. rinse very quickly uh, what is inside before you throw them in a bin that is clean, that will increase the recycling rate. Why? Because if you have cleaner recycling uh, recyclables, you can just actually put it in a bag, you know, maybe mm-hmm. a garbage bag. And instead of you throwing uh, that and with a mixed waste, you can just hand that out to the Palero, the waste collector. The, the Palero right. is very grateful for that because that whole mm-hmm. bag itself, clean, will get him uh, a really good income uh, to su- su- supplement the income. But ensure that, that, but ensure that through that process they make money. But at the same time, ensure that your waste will go to the right recycling facility. Correct, correct. Spot on, Bon. Thank you very much for that explanation. And it's something very pragmatic that every household can do and must do. Um, I'm just going to uh, veer the conversation towards um, incentive because, you know, uh, of course, that makes sense. But also people are wanting to find incentive for the effort that they would put into um, conscientiously preparing their trash for recycling, right? Can I um, ask you, what do you think can government do? to um, incentivize uh, the various sectors involved in this entire recycling ecosystem that we have, um, starting from the very start of the chain in our homes and in the communities? I think we are in, a, in an age of, of heightened awareness and care for the environment. Mm-hmm. And I think, especially the young people, especially the, the, you know, the millennials and Gen Zs, they care about having a world that they could still enjoy, that is beautiful and they could still enjoy. I think if you talk to those kind of, kinds of audiences, they don't need incentive. It is incentive enough to have for them a world that is clean, that is beautiful, and that is rich and green. You know? So to me, if we target the right audience, uh, in terms of encouraging them, creating a revolution, an awakening, and target the right audi- audience in the households and mm-hmm. get them to do this cleaning. I think we can, um, we, we can get a huge participation from the general public. That's one. So it's, it, it's self-driven incentive because of, of the care that they have uh, in terms of the world that they will, they will inherit, and and mm-hmm. their children will inherit, and I think that's a powerful force. Um, let's not discount that. But of course, there's a segment of population who couldn't care less. Uh, mm-hmm. Not because they really don't don't care about the environment, but they are really just so overwhelmed with their own survival and their own lives. So if you're trying mm-hmm. to survive. Uh, trying to, you know, ensure that you'll have food on the table and spend mm-hmm. 18 hours a day trying to do that, would you still have time to even think about your waste? Um, mm-hmm. And that's going to be a, a huge, huge challenge uh, mm-hmm. because we cannot expect uh, frontliners, for example, who are super tired trying to um, ma- care for their patients to be also thinking about managing their waste, and that's reality. Yep. Um, and in those cases, that's where the professional waste management people mm-hmm. will come in. Um, mm-hmm. Because if properly trained and if properly incentivized, the paleros are the key to ensuring that waste are actually properly recovered. <laughs> Uh, and actually diverted to recycling. Um, and of course, that assumes that we have the recy- re- recycling infrastructure within their reach. Now, if you combine those two factors, recycling infrastructure within their reach, and the mm-hmm. system 
incentivized system for the poleros to do the job for everyone because that's their chosen field, that's their profession, and they like doing it. Uh, mm-hmm. and they pride themselves. I've spoken to them. They pride themselves and their role in ensuring that we have a clean environment. And sometimes mm-hmm. they have other choices, but they like doing it. Um, and and if we can encourage uh, and incentivize them and provide the right um, ecosystem, social mm-hmm. protection and social sa- safeguards for these people, they're the key um, because they know what types of wastes can actually be sold. They can be encouraged and equipped on how to better segregate and even clean the waste. Um, because if the market forces, uh, if the incentive of the market can flow to them, meaning mm-hmm. uh, the value of clean, cleaner waste can be can benefit benefit them financially, they will actually do it. So you just have to tweak the system, the, the market system well, because sometimes, I mean, most often uh, today, the pricing of recyclables are dictated by those at the downstream of the value chain. Mm-hmm. Now, if the pricing can be a little bit more standardized and the value derived from the entire collection and recycling business be uh, shifted a little bit more into those collectors, then collection can happen, which is the first important step. When collection happens and there's a meaningful amount, volume of reliable uh, quality feedstock uh, Mm -hmm. in a particular area, then that's the only time that recycling industry will want to invest. So it's a chicken Mm -hmm. and egg. If you don't have feedstock, there's no recycling. If there's no feedstock, if there's no recycling, then there's no incentive to collect. So Mm -hmm. you have to create a program that will simultaneously build both systems. And if if, uh, you do that, um, and, and, and first of all, there's no one size fits all. It needs to be anchored to what kind of uh, economic activities and are in the area. The recycling mm-hmm. type will be based on what will be uh, what can be sold in an area. So, for example, if you build a waste to fuel, plastic waste to fuel, liquid fuel, then you have to have a buyer. So, in the case uh, in the southern Philippines. Uh, the Gupan, uh, there was a proposal to actually build a waste to fuel facility because there there are buyers, uh, fishermen, who uses diesel powered bankas who will actually be willing to buy the fuel that is produced from the waste to fuel. So uh, those things considered um, uh, uh, and many other things will actually ensure that what is built in terms of recycling infrastructure will be sustained. Uh, mm-hmm. And with a steady feedstock, then you will have a steady flow of waste, and then you'll you'll have a steady pool of um, of waste from the waste stream instead mm-hmm. of going to the land landfills and dump sites. There will be a market pool of these materials towards a certain value chain that uh, produces products that is valuable to the market, and that's how you ensure that the materials don't leak to the environment. Good points there, Mon. Thank you very much for sharing. Toph, you're still with us and I'm shifting to you in a while, but just just to kind of close the loop on that discussion. Um, so we talked about already how the households can help to increase the incentive for our paleros or the waste collectors to have a good feedstock, good amount, good volume, good quality of feedstock that is recyclable that in turn would give them better um, financial incentives uh, for doing so. Um, let's talk about the elephant in the room, uh, Bon. And um, these are the low value plastic ways that Waste collectors don't anymore waste time collecting because uh, recyclers don't bother recycling them at all. So what policy intervention do you think can potentially um, address this? And is this where the extended producer responsibility principles would apply? All right. First of all, um, the recyclability of um, flexible packaging, what you call low value packaging, relies on 
the type and structure of packaging, number one. And then number two, um, the cleanness of these packaging. Now, mm -hmm. because um, uh, most of them are structured in a manner that is difficult to recycle, whether they're cleaned or not, they don't, they don't get recycled. But if they're structured in a way that there is high uh, content of polypropylene and or polyethylene and lower content of uh, PET, mm -hmm. then that's actually highly recyclable. And if okay. a material is highly recyclable, then it's not actually a low value because they can be okay. turned into plastic products. The first step is to shift in terms of packaging structure mm -hmm. to more recyclable components so that the low value will become higher value. And if right. it has value, then it will be collected. All right. And, and again, the, the other step, of course, is uh, the users, the consumer's effort mm -hmm. to just rinse it. It's just a matter of putting water and shaking it and then uh, pouring the water and then you're good to go. It's a very simple process. Um, mm -hmm. But if everyone does it, then what comes out from our waste are cleaner. Now, if you have better structures, then there will be a waste recycling facility for them. Then you solve the mm -hmm. problem. They're no longer mm -hmm. low value. Um, but then uh, you would say that it's easier said than done. Of course, yes. Because since they are thin, then you it takes so much effort to collect a significant amount that's meaningful to sell. Okay. And um, since, since it's very laborious and it takes a, a, you know, an effort to collect them, um, what, what happens is it's too cumbersome for the, the paleros to collect. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and this is exactly where the producers can come into play. If the producers uh, will have a system of uh, compensating whatever is collected and processed and permanently mm -hmm. converted and transformed to product, if the um, industry, the producers and importers who produce products that has components that eventually end up in marine litter, would have a commitment, and I've worked with many of them that has made commitments to ensure uh, that these systems of collection will be set up and they will cover mm -hmm. some of the costs of recovery through an extended producer responsibility scheme, uh, then you're actually uh, now going to have the right uh, mechanism for its effective collection. Uh, and then ultimately uh, processing and conversion into a product that wouldn't have high, a high chance of, um, um, of, of leaking to the environment. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that this packaging needs to be small and thin. It has a purpose. Number one, the cost of the product could grossly be affected by the cost of the packaging. And if you're trying to reduce the cost of the product to meet the capability of the market, the low-income families to access mm -hmm. the products, then you must make the packaging as thin as possible. That objective goes against the recycling objective yes. because then it's yeah. now very difficult to recycle. Mm -hmm. But if you have the system that I just mentioned, then actually you will be solving the problem. Now, how will that scheme actually work? The EPR, market-based EPR scheme. It can work if there's a, a system of first um, accounting, how much waste the recycling industry is able to collect. Second, mm -hmm. certification to ensure that what they collect is indeed what is reported. Mm -hmm. And make issuance of some sort of credit that this is what you know they have accomplished. 
And then maybe for each amount of credit, then the producer will actually, uh, you know, cover some cost um, or, or pay an amount to, to compensate those who were able to successfully um, demonstrate that they have collected and uh, diverted certain types of uh, flexible packaging or even the recycled boys uh, into certain value chains. Uh, and that through that mechanism, the diverters will get additional um, financial resources to do more, to expand. And then you'd, you'd have more and more companies committing to that and even having a regulation uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, a target for companies to divert, divert a portion of their footprint and increase that mm -hmm. through, uh, through 2030, for example. Uh, then you'll have uh, the, the drive for more companies wanting to avail of the credits because they want to show that a portion of mm -hmm. the footprint has actually been... Um, uh, con recovered and converted right. into something. So with that system, with that scheme, we call that market-based mm -hmm. EPR scheme, uh, as opposed to the traditional EPR scheme that we see in European systems. Uh, mm -hmm. We feel that in the Philippines, if you set that up, uh, and we are trying to set it up, and we are you know, uh, uh, setting the the systems, uh, the stakeholders in place as we speak, mm -hmm. um, then um, the impact will be the producers will be able to effectively discharge their responsibility of their waste footprint. And then the, in, the recyclers will be able to scale up their investments mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there will be feedstock and because there will be market for their recycled products. That's how we propose we, we solve this uh, problem of marine litter. It's very great to hear that uh, this initiative is um, being done at this time, Monar. Very, very timely, especially as we see a lot of uh, waste materials being um, used and not impro not properly disposed during the pandemic. Um, tying this together, uh, and this is my sense of it, is that there needs to be an effective communication to the consumers as well that businesses are making the investment towards this um, highly recyclable uh, material. Even if they come in a sachet, as you mentioned, there's a structure to the sachet that can make it highly recyclable still. But I presume that that involves a lot of business investments as well, which brings me to the point uh, of asking Toph um, from Mondelez Philippines here. So Toph, Mondelez International is on its way to achieving 100% packaging that is recycling ready. And I'm sure that there has a lot of, that involved a lot of investments right there. This is a target that it aims to achieve by 2025. So locally, uh, what's being done to contribute to this goal? Hi, Pink. Um, before I, I address the, the point specifically, allow me to, to step back a little and uh, just mm -hmm. thank you for, for allowing us to continue um, this conversation. If you recall, of course, a couple of months ago, we began this conversation by talking about uh, the issue of plastic packaging in the Philippines. And to my mind, that was the first time that we brought together such a high-level panel to talk about the mm -hmm. problem and what, what was really the issue at hand. And I think during that forum, we correctly identified that plastic itself is not evil. It's not the enemy. As a matter of fact, particularly in, in the food industry, for food packaging, plastic plays an essential role in, in making sure that the products are kept safe, fresh, and gets to the consumers in the right condition. Now, having said that, I think today's webinar is, is, is a very good continuation. It's a logical next step in terms of uh, continuing that conversation because Having established now that plastic is not the problem, and I think it becomes very important in this context of the COVID pandemic, particularly when we see, we look around, you know, and look around the communities. Uh, you made a, uh, an example earlier about uh, ideally, uh, there are people who are pushing for a zero waste or a zero plastic uh, lifestyle. But in reality, mm -hmm. now in the COVID pandemic, the first priority of people is really their safety and the safety of their families, right? So when you talk sure. about food, for instance, uh, they're logical, especially for our, our countrymen who are uh, living below the poverty line. 
uh, unfortunately, their first instinct is really to look for the cheapest, most affordable uh, form of packaging. And at, at the moment, it is, it is really plastic. And uh, we've seen also policymakers adjust um, to this reality. We've seen some local governments that uh, a year ago had very stringent rules on certain forms of plastic. And they have relaxed this a bit during this pandemic, taking into consideration, I think, the fact that uh, that's the reality. You know, um, when you get your food, your first priority is really the safety of, of that uh, of the thing that you're eating, right? So for us in Mondelez, Philippines, we also uh, take this into consideration. And um, going back to your point, uh, the commitments that Mondelez has made globally, you know, number one is really to reduce our packaging material. And that means taking out unnecessary plastic from our packaging mm -hmm. formats. And uh, we've done some, we've made some pretty good progress here. We've eliminated almost 60,000 tons of unnecessary plastic uh, from our packaging. Uh, likewise, as you said, we have committed, and now uh, we've made this commitment public. Uh, we've committed to turn all of our packaging material, either recyclable or recycle-ready, by 2025. And this is a global commitment uh, mm -hmm. that we've made. And to further support uh, the commitment, we, of course, are uh, working very closely with industry, with government, non-government organizations to help support uh, improved infrastructure and to ensure that there is greater harmonization of all of these materials so that we can ensure that all of this packaging is properly collected and properly recycled. Um, because thing, I think one thing that has to be highlighted is that this is really a shared problem, right? Uh, I think one of right, the problems right. here, here in the Philippines mm -hmm. is that we have that not, not in my backyard mentality, wherein we think mm -hmm. that once we throw our, our trash in the trash bin or we've segregated yeah. our trash, then that's it. We've done our role. We've done our responsibility. Unfortunately, and, and thank you, Bonar, for really enlightening me on some of the uh, some of the relevant pieces in the entire uh, stream of, of waste management. I think it's become very clear in today's webinar that uh, we all have to play our roles. And as Bonar pointed out, all components have to be working together. It can't be just mm -hmm. one component working effectively. It has to be everyone working in 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 sync to make sure that this does work uh, effectively. So Mon for, from the part of, on the part of Mondelez, no, internationally, we are part of a lot of uh, uh, global organizations and we've signed on to several commitments such as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, New Plastics mm -hmm. Economy Global Commitment. We're also part of the uh, New Plastics Economy Initiative and the, and the UK Plastics Pact, which basically uh, uh, reiterates the commitments that we've made in terms of plastic waste reduction and in terms of making our packs uh, recyclable. And further, we, we also uh, want to make sure that more than just making them recyclable or recycle-ready, we contribute also to the education by providing recycling information uh, on the packs uh, by 2025 as well. Uh, and then, of course, in the Philippines. Uh, in the Philippines, we work uh, very closely and a very close partner of, uh, of Mondelez Philippines is, of course, an industry association called PARPS, the Philippine mm -hmm. Alliance for Recycling and Material Sustainability. Uh, this is a industry association which is composed of some of the biggest uh, multinational companies here in the Philippines. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see that uh, such a coalition is in place because you don't find this very often, that a lot of mm -hmm. these uh, competing industries are uh, banded together for a single cause, a unified cause. And in this case, it's really to, to improve uh, the, the waste management problem uh, here in the Philippines. And some of the achievements of this organization, PARMS, is that um, the member organizations, for instance, have contributed a certain amount towards the construction of a recycling facility in Paranaque City. And uh, hopefully mm -hmm. we'll see that up in uh, operational in the near future so that we can really showcase uh, in terms of a pilot uh, and see what can really be done in terms of establishing, the, as Boner mentioned earlier, establishing this uh, recycling uh, infrastructure that sorely needed Correct. here in our country. And uh, just this year, uh, Ping, uh, we, in January mm -hmm. of this year, uh, PARMS and the PARMS member organizations signed on to a plastics pledge, right? And in this pledge, mm -hmm. we committed to a uh, ambition. And we said that we are committing to an ambition of uh, zero waste to nature by 2030. And I think that's a very powerful message uh, to send, not just uh, mm -hmm. 
to to our fellow members in the industry, but also to government and to policymakers, and to let them know that the industry is proactively working towards solving the problem of plastic waste and waste management. No? Uh, so uh, this is really a, a great uh, development for us, and Mondelez Philippines is very happy to support uh, these type of initiatives, of course, working with you and Eco Business, for instance, also in terms of educating our public uh, for greater awareness and to ensure that uh, our, our countrymen are properly informed on what the real score is uh, with regard to this issue. Thank you so much, Tov. And for Mondelez Philippines being continuously invested in these kinds of conversation, I can't agree with you more, Tov, that uh, it is a continuing challenge that needs a concerted effort by all sectors of society. And I don't think that there's an end to this conversation until we've radically shifted our uh, patterns uh, into circular economy and making sure that, as you pointed out very well, that there's a reduction in the use of the material, but also at the same time, there's a delivery of uh, the needs of the public at this time, uh, especially uh, during this time. So, yeah, I, I do appreciate our partnership, Toph, and thank you for the genuine um, concern and investment that you're making um, on behalf of Mondelez Philippines and Mondelez International into making sure that uh, the awareness is there and action comes after. So, I guess I'm wrapping up to uh, the last two questions of this um, uh, podcast episode that we're having. So Bonner, um, thank you for providing us with um, the insights uh, into how the the entire recycling infrastructure in the Philippines um, in its current status should evolve so that we would be able to preempt, you know, or avoid altogether uh, a plastic crisis, which I guess is um, what this talk is all about in the end. Uh, we have a crisis that we are um, talking about and seeing right now. And Toph, you're right, we're proactively acting on, um, especially on the private sector side. Um, with this in mind, how can we turn uh, the plastic quote-unquote crisis into an opportunity for, for the Philippines. Um, any last words uh, from you, Bonner and Toph, on recycling and how everyone can take part of it as an opportunity instead of just a problem that's being that other people are waiting um, for government or for other sectors in society to, to solve for them? How can we engage the wider community to take this chance, seize this opportunity to take an impending plastic pandemic into an opportunity to make lasting change? Um, from where I stand, uh, now is the time to seriously look at how we make recycling viable as a business. Um, if we cannot make recycling profitable and interesting enough for investors, then our lack of in recycling infrastructure will continue to persist. So it's very important that we set up a sort of scheme that will help make the an enabling policy that will help make recycling more profitable and viable in the country. Um, and even more important because recycling industry could deliver a huge number of jobs Jobs mm -hmm. that many people have lost because of the pandemic. And uh, if we set up uh, the recycling infrastructure, and we're not just talking about into products, but also into energy and, and many other models, uh, ways to fuel, to asphalt roads, to um, construction materials, many, many uh, solutions that are available. If we can make these models more viable, it can be scaled up. When these things scale up, you create jobs and ultimately you solve the problem. Thank you, Bon. Tough. any last words? Uh, thank you, Ping. Um, I couldn't agree with Bonar more. Um, I think what has become very apparent and is very clear uh, as a result of today's session is that there is clearly a need for a harmonized approach in waste management. And what this means really is it entails contributions from all of us, from individuals, from industry, from government. I think for, for individuals, it means that we should continue to be aware of, of uh, the importance of collecting waste and properly segregating your waste. For industry, this means uh, entailing some investment on their part to ensure that their 
their packaging is recyclable or recycle ready to make it easier for their packs to be recycled. And for government, government of course, as highlighted during uh, our discussion, to provide incentives for uh, the recycling industry to really blossom and uh, for it to take root in, in, uh, and make, uh, make it a viable business. Uh, so I think all of these components are very crucial in solving, as we pointed out, this shared problem of all of us. So I think to close, I think it's also very appropriate that uh, for us in Mondelez, during this time of pandemic, we actually use the hashtag. You know? We call it hashtag stronger together to talk about what we are doing uh, collectively to help uh, improve our conditions during these challenging times. And I think this hashtag also finds very uh, good application in this issue because really uh, we believe that better outcomes and impact on waste can only be achieved if industry, government, and non-government organizations will work together to tackle this complex and uh, multifaceted problem. So truly, uh, the solution really has to be for us to be uh, hashtag stronger together. Uh, thank you very much, Ping, for giving us the opportunity in the platform to uh, thresh out these issues today. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Toph, and on behalf of your team at Mondelez Philippines for supporting this conversation today. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We have Mr. Bono Loreto, Executive Director, Business for Sustainable Development, and the Country Manager for Corporate and Government Affairs for Mondelez Philippines, Mr. Toph Prada. This has been the Eco Business Podcast. Join us again next time. This podcast was hosted by EcoBusiness. EcoBusiness is the leading digital media company serving the region's sustainability community. This episode is supported by Mondelez Philippines as part of its leadership in driving key conversations around sustainable packaging and plastic waste management in the food industry. Join the conversation by visiting eco-business.com. Follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.